Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I want to call the order the Cabarrus County Board of Education to work session meeting to order. And at this time, I'd like to have a motion for uh, us to approve the uh, set agenda that's already, you've had it since last week. Are there any uh, changes or corrections to the agenda? Otherwise, do I have a motion? Second. Okay, I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Okay, mo uh, agenda set. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we, to, as you know, and as it's been advertised, uh, that we're having our public hearing this evening for the Cabarrus County Schools 2012-2013 budget. And at this time, we need a motion to open the public hearing. So moved. I have motion. Second. I have a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Okay, now we are in uh, ready for the public hearing to start. And at this time, we only have one uh, speaker that has signed up, and that is Miss Yuji. So, Miss Yuji, you know the rules and the, all that. You have three minutes, and when you start, the timer starts, and, and we're going to be listening to you. Thank you. You ready? Ready. I was here last April uh, for the first time, and I'd given you um, probably a three-page list as well as pictures of our school grounds um, about the things that um, are needed um, to complete our school. Um, as you're aware, we built that school in 2002, and since then we have either upgraded or built 22 schools since then. And this year will be our 10-year um, anniversary and we still don't have a completed school. Um, also, I want to state is that a couple months ago, we had a meeting from the county, and we were told now we're going to be on a five-year uh, list on getting things done. Um, since 2002, we were on a 10-year list, and not much was completed. So really, we're going to be on a 15-year list. And I really think that we need to um, not wait five more years. Uh, we need to put us at the top of the list, complete what, the, what I had mentioned earlier, and as far as security lights in the back, as far as a fence, um, fixing the handicap ramp needs to be really replaced. That's what the engineer told me, and not just patched work, And because he only finished like three little patches of it and then left the rest, and it's all wavy, sinking, cracking. And um, we have the sinking flagpoles in front, and so we have a, numerous issues that are health and safety issues. So my goal tonight is to mention that let's finish what we started, because that's what we tell our children, and let's, let's get it done and not put us on uh, any more of a waiting list. Um, the other thing that um, Dr. Williams wanted me to mention, uh, the principal at our school, is that um, we were overlooked for the wireless, um, this um, particular last budget um, item and he um, wanted me to mention that we do need that as well and we're one of the few schools that don't have that and that's all I want to say tonight thank you thank you miss Yuji mm -hmm. okay uh, miss Monroe do we have any other registered speakers at this time okay all right ladies and gentlemen that's the only speaker that we had was miss Yuji and so now I'll call for a motion to close the public hearing I have a motion. Second. I have a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Okay. The uh, public hearing has closed. All right. Board members, we're going to move. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely. Thank you, Ms. Mine, and I'm going to pass that uh, comment on to Dr. Shepard. Would you like to address that, Dr. Shepard? I've asked this class today when they're doing an email to you. I'll be prepared to answer that for us. 
Okay, you call that passing the buck. Miss <laughs> Clutz is going to get it. Okay. <laughs> um, Thank you. Um, I, we have a budget process that's been outlined. Um, I believe last year's budget process is posted on our website and certainly can update our website with our current budget process. We've asked for a lot of encouragement and participation in our budget process through our school improvement teams and our, our school principals. Um, and we would encourage um, parent participation, school improvement teams, students, and we would ask for that type of um, direction and, and participation at that level to come um, prior to now. We've started our budget process in October and we're looking for that kind of direction. We've been having budget committee meetings um, at least um, bi-weekly since then and been looking for direction. Um, this would be, we're looking for more um, direction at this point if we, um, posted our budget as our proposed budget and then asked for direction, then we would be recreating the wheel at that point. Um, then we would need to, I believe, have four or five other um, board meetings after that point to redirect. We want to make sure that we get it right before we come to the board with a proposal. That's what we've been doing since October is gathering input and getting information from all of our subcommittees and various committees. We have 40 advisory committees, 20 subcommittees, and gathering information from anyone that's willing to give us input so that when we um, do a, a proposal to the board, we want to make sure that we get it to the best place possible for you to approve it at that time. Maybe we should put something on our website to address that. Yeah, because I understand mm -hmm. that you're encouraging people to participate in the meetings, but realistically, not everybody's going to want to. Mm -hmm. They'll have to come and be part of the meeting. So, mm -hmm. And as a, as a board member, I was kind of, I just didn't know where I think we were hopeful that that would come from our school levels, our school improvement teams, and all of those advisory committees and subcommittees that we've created. We were hopeful that we were reaching out far enough. We also did surveys, that kind of thing. Um, so we were hopeful that we were reaching out far enough and getting those those comments and questions. Um, but we can certainly continue to improve our process and, and do that. We can um, reach out to our website and improve. Okay, mine's working. And, and one question I have, the speaker that spoke earlier, basically like the improvements that she mentioned, the, the for instance, the ramp, is this not something that should be addressed by those principals? I mean, should that not be put in the plan that they put forth, that principal at that school, to say, this is something that's a priority for me and should that not be put in his plan to us? They work with our school, uh, with our facilities management team, with the principal. So co cohesively, cohesively, they work together to make sure that we get that information. Um, and you will be working on March 22nd to see that plan as we then submit that as a capital project to the county. So yes, to answer your question simply. That's what I thought we should be. So that's that's where I'm getting kind of lost because those that's what I thought the principals were supposed to be doing and put their priorities. If they don't put those priorities, that's why those things aren't done. They put something else higher for that, and that's why those things haven't been done. Is that correct? Well, let me explain. In the past, we asked principals because we knew realistically we could not get to all of our needs in, in Cabarrus County Schools. We had too many. So we asked them to give us their three highest needs, basically knowing that those others were not going to be um, – we were not going to be able to obtain, obtain funding for those. So they just didn't get looked at. Um, so they may not have been on the list. 
this year and last year, we decided we're going to we're going to look at every every need that you have. Now you may be overcome by that list on March 22nd. It's a it's a little large. And those are contradicting terms, but it is large. It's a large list. So um, now the principal has the opportunity to give us the entire list of their needs. So I think it looks like 180 million ish, something like that. So. You'll see that list on March 22nd. Okay, thank you, Ms. Klutz. And now, board members, we're going to move on into the report section, and you're up next for our budget status report. I'll comment while she's getting her uh, computer up there. And if you remember, board members, we did the Trago process last year, which was the first time that we'd ever done the Trago process. And uh, I'm like Miss Monnet. That was one of the questions that I asked whenever we were doing the planning for the agenda. Was you know the public hasn't been able to see the figures and the numbers and all. But what happens is is when uh, you're using the Trago process that we're using, it's got so many hundreds of people actually involved that what happens is is that after you have prioritized this and you've done the the risk analysis and all of that and then all these other things come into play then that disturbs what you've already done so that's sort of the way that i've seen it the way that i tried to take it anyway but but um, but anyway that was just my two cents worth miss klutz if you want to continue thank you um, I'm going to give you a budget update. This is the first of four meetings that we're going to talk about budget in our board setting today. Um, and so I want to just start um, by, I, I'm going to talk about four different things. I'm going to talk about um, the state of the state. And so I'm going to talk about broadly North Carolina. And then I'm going to talk about the state of Cabarrus County Schools. And so then that will be specific to Cabarrus County Schools. I'm going to talk about our budget process in general, just remind you a little bit about that. And then we're going to eventually talk about our technology budget at, at the end, and we'll go in detail about that. So I'm going to start um, with, actually, I'm going to start with our budget process and just a little bit of a reminder about that. And I mentioned back in October we started this process, and we looked at our, um, our needs for 2012, 2013, and we said they're going to be a little bit different than they were last year. We were projecting that we needed to cut 10 to 15 percent last year, and this year we said uh, maybe that wasn't necessary, but we wanted to look at that. So we did determine our needs. Then from November to January, we looked at these subcommittee committees. We created them and we trained them. As I mentioned before, there were about 40 advisory committees. There were 20 subcommittees, and each of those committees contained a variety of different people, 20, 30 different people in each of those committees. So we had large groups of, of people. Then in February, we administered budget hearings. Those were in our internal budget hearings where we gathered information. And then in February last year, we, we submitted a survey out to our, our stakeholders, and we wanted to hear what they had to say, and we gathered lots of information about that. This year we didn't. We decided that that wasn't necessary, but what we did want you to know is that we did an operational efficiencies video, and we did that because last year you guys gave us really good ideas. You gave us about 72 ideas that could save us money, and out of those ideas we picked about five of those that we have saved about a million dollars, and we wanted to tell you about that in our video. So we would encourage you to go to our website and take a look at our video, and we'll tell you how we saved our system about a million dollars. We also have some other ideas of those 72 ideas that we're still researching. We have some that we've implemented and some that we said, eh, maybe those aren't great ideas. But we, we still, we've still put a lot of research and thought into your ideas. Um, also, February right now, um, we were in the process, we're continuing to prioritize our recommendations for our budget. We did that in February and we're still doing that. As I said, this is the first of four meetings that we're going to um, work through with the board. So our budget committee is still in the process of working. 
and then we are going to develop a proposed budget for our board. Okay? So these are the four meetings that I'm talking with you about. The current meeting that we're in, March 22nd, we're going to do facilities management. That's the detailed list um, that we talk about all those projects at the school level. I'm also going to talk about capital outlay projects. And then we're going to follow up on any questions or concerns that you have on technology items. On April the 2nd, I'll meet with you again. And we'll talk about operational budget. And those are things like health insurance increases, retirement increases, Duke power increases, those kind, of, those kind of things, operational. And then we're also going to look at that big increase, decrease list. Um, if you want to increase something in our budget, what would you do? What would you give up so that we can increase? So we'll look at that list. Then we're also going to follow up on any technology, facilities and operations, and capital outlay um, items that you have questions or concerns about. And then after all of that discussion, and since we started in October, I hope that you'll adopt a budget for me, a proposed budget. Okay. Okay. So this is what I know about the state of the state at the moment. Revenues are ahead of the budget, $145 million at January, which that's really good news for us. So if they continue, and they're expected to continue, then we'll be $200 million over at June 30th. Um, the economy is obviously looking better, and economic, economists are consistent with their projection for the first time. In the past, they've been, one economist would be, would be high and the other economist would be low, but they are um, consistent with their projections. Obviously, um, unemployment is going down at the moment. Our current biennium budget was projected on an index of 3.8%. Normal um, state budgets are predicted on the average of 5.7%. There is a, a thought or an idea that we might be able to go back into this biennium budget and predict or, or base the budget on the 5.7% index. If they're able to do that, then obviously that creates more revenue and then you can increase your expense. So that's where that would mean good things for us. Okay. Now, those good things for us, we would all want to be saying the same thing and requesting the same thing across the state. So what we would want to do at state level, at, the, at school systems, is we would want to reduce or eliminate a negative reversion. At the state level, that's $503 million for school systems. Now, for us, it's this year's $8.4 million Next year, $9.9 .9 million. Um, we would also want to restore salary increases for public school employees. So those are the two things at the state level we would want to all be sending a common message so that we're saying the same thing. Kelly, may I interrupt you for a minute, Mr. Chairman? If you don't mind, I would love to have clarification on what a reversion is. I get more questions from the general public on what yes. is a reversion. They have no clue if that's us doing something, who's doing it, and what's taking place. It's a Do very, you mind? Good, yes, that would a be very great. good question. When we get, our budget is generally somewhere, a state level budget is generally somewhere around $140 million. It depends on how much the state gives or takes away that year. So if our, our state level budget is $140 million, automatically within 30 days the state will say you have 140 million dollars but we want you to give us back 8.4 million dollars by the way you you may tell us how in what form you want to give it back so I'm not going to tell you you cut teachers and you cut teacher assistants you make that decision locally you as a board make that decision locally we're not going to tell you at the state how to do it you decide Okay, and we've been doing that for a long time, and I've got a graph in here that shows you how we've been doing it and how that amount increases every year. Okay. And that reversion is based on ADM? It is based on ADM. Mm-hmm. It is. Okay. All right. These are a couple graphs that we were um, given at the state level, 
and this is a state level graph, a state le level numbers, and then I've, I've populated it with um, Cabarrus County school numbers in the next graph, but this is state level numbers. In 2008, the state had 1.4 million students, and that's the bar, and there were, they were being served by 187,000 adults, okay? Now, in 2012, there was 1.4 million students, but we were, being, were now serving those students with 175,000 adults, okay? So clearly, we're serving more students with less adults, okay? Now, this is Cabarrus County school, Schools Graph, 2008. 26,000 students serving um, 3,396 adults in 2012, 29,000 students serving 3,339 adults. Now these are full-time equivalents and if you'll note we have less adults than we did in 2008 serving those adults, serving those children. Now the next graph that I want to show you, this um, is funding for pupil, per pupil, and this is state level data. And what we're showing you is state funding and major ARA dollars. And that is, um, the ARA dollars basically just supplanted the, the state level dollars. So you'll see in the, the yellow bar, the colors are a little bit distorted, so it's hard for me to tell. Um, you can see that 186 is the ARA dollars, and when it goes down, in 2012-2013, the ARA will go away. And so you'll see in 2008-2009, there's $5,767 per pupil we received at the state level. And in 2012-2013, we're projected to have $5,355 per pupil, significantly just declining. And that's state level. Now, if you'll remember that we are getting, at the state level on average, $5,355 per pupil at 2012-2013. That's at the state level. This is Cabarrus County Schools. And if you'll look at that same um, bar to the right, 2012-2013, Cabarrus County Schools is anticipated to have $4,597 per pupil in 2012-2013. Now we started in 2008 with $5,252 per pupil. Again, the same decline. This is the, the discretionary reversion. Sometimes it's called discretionary reversion. Sometimes it's called negative reversion. They interchange those terms. 2008, 2009, um, we returned $1.9 million. And next year, 2012, 2013, it's built into the biennium budget for us to return $9.9 .9 million. And we can choose how we do it. It's our option. Just out of curiosity, Ms. Clutch, you have it capped off at $10 million there, and we're obviously there. Is that the cap, or no. is there a cap? No, sir. It can go on. It could go on. It could go on. I'm hoping there's a cap. <laughs> okay. Just uh, some quick information here. I get this question a good bit from uh, teachers. Um, we are advocating for... A pay increase for teachers, obviously, or, or public school employees, um, but they will never get called up on the current pay scale because we've not had a, a, a pay increase for many years. So the, the, um, they're advocating for a pay increase on the current pay scale because they cannot, there's not time to get a new pay scale between now and the short session. And so they're, they will be looking at a new pay scale for next year, but there's no possible way that it will get corrected 
by this year. So the, the hope is just to get a pay adjustment at all by this fiscal year. Okay. So the question is 180 or 185 days, of course, um, but when you attach money to it, it makes it a little easier. Um, so we don't obviously know the answer to that question, but when you attach $14.6 million, um, it gives it more significance. So um, they encouraged us to uh, file our waiver when, when they attached the dollar to it. So we did. We had already done that. So virtual public schools, um, DPI, this is just to let you know, DPI um, is going to change the formula, and so it's probably going to cost us more money to take virtual classes next year. Um, planning allotments were expected by the end of February. They've been delayed a little bit and expected within the next couple of days. This is just to show you that we are still in increase in growth mode, which is good for us. That's what sustains our our um, our dollars it helps keeps us healthy 662 uh, for next year and this is the state's projections operating expense health insurance is expected to increase 261 dollars per employee that's our portion um, that we have to to maintain retirement expense goes from 13.12 to 14.31 percent and um, energy rate increase that we need to plan for would be approximately 6%. Okay. This is um, our fund balance projections, and I just want to show you this so that you know. Bottom line on this is I think we've done a good job planning. We're in a, we're in a good place. Um, we are, our fund balance is $7.7 .7 million at the end of, at June 30th last year, this, this recent year. Um, we uh, anticipate, anticipated from this past year in our budget planning that we would increase our fund balance by $2 million. We planned on p just tucking away, saving $2 million. And so that will put us at $9.5 million at June 30th. And if we're at $9.5 million on July 1st of next year, we know that we're going to lose $5.6 million in our funds. We know that. So I like to round, and I know there's going to be some expenses that, that we're going to need to t cover, so I put $6 million there that we're going to need to cover. So we also know, based on that graph that I just did, that we're going to lose $1.4 million because that's in the budget for the state, that discretionary reduction. And we also know that there's some increase in some operational funds that I just talked about. I talked about the health insurance, the retirement, and those type of things. So we're going to have to appropriate fund balance for that because we know that the county has said we were going to be flat funded. We normally get those expenses from the county. So then we also know that we, we got some growth coming from the state. And we should expect to get about $3 million. Now that's an increase, not a decrease. So that's the opposite side. At the end of the day, on June 30th. Now these are all projections, but we should be nearly $5 million. So our fund balance is going to go from 9.5 down to $5 million at that year. Okay, that's June 30th, 2013. So we're going to start again the next year. So if you net, when you start the $6 million and you net those negatives and the positives right there, you're going to end up with $4.6 million because anything that's that's a recurring expense and you don't have recurring funds to take care of that expense, you've got to have fund balance to take care of. So that's where your 4.6 comes from. So that's why we have to appropriate $4.6 million the following year. And it's a step down approach. You had $7.2 million this year that you're going to appropriate, then you have $4.6 million that year. And then the next year, you only have, have 1.3. We're going to step down until we get out of this mess. But we're going to get out of it soon. Thank goodness. <laughs> okay? All right. So what you're left with is June 2014, you're at $3.3 .3 million, which is not very much money, but we're not broke either. Okay? So what I'm showing you here is our fund balance history. 
2007, 2008, we had 4 million. And then 2010, 2011, it's 7.7 .7 million. And that's because we planned, planned to increase that fund balance. And now we're going to need to use it. Okay? And we should have of a minimum about 4.8 million dollars in our fund balance to just m to maintain sound business practices and cash flow. Okay. All right. Questions? Board members, do you have questions on the budget that she has gone over with us or do you want to go ahead and hear the technology and then ask it all at the same time? How do you prefer? Um, Mr. Chair, I have one question about the very last number, the anticipated fund balance on June 30th, 2014? Yes. That's obviously below the 4.8 recommended. It is. So any strategies yet moving forward or? You want me to tell you? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, you know, we hope, we're, the state with the increase in revenues uh, the above projections, um, they're encouraging us that um, we're not going to have they're, we're asking for raises and we're asking for um, a reduction of the, the discretionary reversion, which in my mind means if you're going to ask for a reduction in a discretionary reversion, my thought is that you're not going to increase the discretionary reversion. So my hope is that 1.4 is going to go away. Yeah, so that would put us right in line to where we need to be. And hopefully we can take advantage of your rounding up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> They'll be rounding down. There, there might be a little bit of that, too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Ms. Kelly, just make sure I'm following you correctly on that. I'm, I'm still on that same slide. Okay. The 2013, so down at the bottom, after June 30th, 2013, that appropriated fund balance, that's everything that we anticipate happening that year to have to pull out. You, I mean, where's that number? The 4.6. Where's the, yeah, where does it come from? Is the it 4.6 comes from, you take that 6 million from above, the 1.4 million, the 2 million, less the 3 million. Because okay, so it's just a duplicate of what's above. It's the net. Mm -hmm. It's, those are, those are recurring expenses up there, the 6 million, the 1 million, the 2 million, those are, because basically we're paying people's salaries out of those things. We didn't make recurring cuts. We're paying recurring expenses out of those line items when we appropriate those fund balances for those things. Okay. And we didn't have recurring money to, to pay it with. Right. So until we build back recurring funds, and that's where that $3 million is, that mm -hmm. the $3 million is recurring money. Until we can offset that with recurring money, we have to keep stepping down like this okay I, I guess I'm, I'm somewhat hung up on the the loss of the our stimulus money I mean it, it's it's gone and been gone and then here it shows up again I mean how many years are we gonna have to say oh well we don't get stimulus this year and we have to negative that out we lost we lost some of our money last year and this is different our money this is um, the ed jobs bill it's two is different our funds Okay. All right. I'm sure over the next three more meetings, I'll <laughs> I'll get that squared away. Okay. Okay. And two, my question is: We appropriated a fund balance one time for the STEM program, and I noticed you're taking it out twice. How long are we going to keep having to take out a fund balance for the STEM program? No. Uh, that uh, is the one time. I'm just showing you. Uh, yeah, but you're, I see it two times. Uh, uh, well, you're showing it in one balance, and then you see it twice, 200000 and 200000 That's 400000 Two different, Two different things. The one up top is the magnets. That's where I appropriated it for the magnets. The one in the middle is operating expense. That's health insurance, retirement expense. Yes, it's different. Same That's not, so it, it, it's not the same thing not then. The same thing. So you're it's only doing it once. Okay. Well, I saw 200,000, not 200,000. So that is something different. Okay. Yeah. All right. I just wanted to make sure we weren't 
doing it in a, a second time. Okay. All right. I'm good. <laughs> okay. Anybody else want to make any comments? It's pretty hard to uh, beat up on Kelly because she's pretty sharp on them numbers there. Yeah. So anyway, Ms. Clutch, if you want to continue on the technology okay. part. Thank you. All right. Well, <laughs> we'll go to technology. We'll let you beat up on Ms. Probes. Okay. Um, wow. All right, let me get it where you can see it. Okay. Um, okay. Our technology, she has a, uh, Dr. Probst has a technology um, subcommittee. Is that what you call your subcommittee? And they have worked to prepare this technology list for you. Um, and we have worked many, many, many hours on it. And what you have before you is, is a list that we have come to an agreed um, level amongst our committees. We have um, within the facilities and operations, technology, um, seems like there's one other that I'm leaving out, but a level We've tried to, to um, understand our levels. The level zero is, th th it means that it's mandatory and, and must be complete with one, within one year. Um, a level one means that it's urgent and it should be completed within one year. A level two is required and should be complete within two years. And beyond that, you know, we just can't afford it. <laughs> It, I mean, there are there are levels, but we just can't afford it. Um, so we tried to place a level on everything, um, and then we we ranked them so that you guys knew what we were talking about consistently throughout the system, and also so that the county understood our logic. So I will let you look at the list, and I will let Dr. Probst explain anything technical um, that you have questions about. And anything that was required or a level zero did not go through the process because it was required. Anything that was optional or somewhat optional did go through the TRIGO process with her committee. And the one thing I would like to add is that working with Kannapolis and the county, um, we are reviewing some of these items and seeing collaboratively if we can purchase the item as all three agencies and, and lower the price. Uh, one of those would be our Microsoft uh, licensing. Instead of the open, we go with more of an enterprise agreement, which would allow us to update all of our computers uh, for the end users to the most current uh, version and keep that current version in front of the kids and the adults and um, we really like the fact that we're starting to get extremely competitive with our vendors because now that they realize all three of us are coming together the prices have really started to go down so we like that piece you can see we requested quite a lot but we did not get all the way to the funding uh, for request we got down into the renewal cycle uh, mm -hmm. with a discussion as to whether to go with the renewal cycle or um, fund some of our schools uh, as the parent mentioned earlier this evening that might not be up to date with their networks or wireless Ms. Uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. on the the number you said what number is it that you're referring to that we got um, down if to? you will look let's see I think it's Kelly, uh, we got all the way mm -mm. into item 37, oh, yeah. uh, item 36, 37 is kind of where we ended up. Um, if you look at 37, 38, is into a discussion as to whether we would do the compute lease. It's been the same, um, the computer lease has been the same uh, for the last 10 years. Uh, it's, it funds about 900 machines a year. Okay, board members, do you have any questions to uh, Ms. Probst on the technology portion of, her, of this report? So we go 37 back Mike. all the way down? Yes, ma'am. So we're 37 on back. We did everything there? Correct, 1 through 37, with the hope that if coming in with the county in Kannapolis that let's say we can get the Microsoft agreement down, any money we can save in those prior items can help us get further down on the list. And that's assuming that the money, that's what you're predicting the money would be. Well, and what we did was 
it stopped the list the money stops in the middle of 37 and what we did is we requested uh, like four hundred and eighty thousand dollars to go on to our prioritized list at, into the operating budget and so what we're ha gonna have to do is we're gonna have to give up something to get four hundred thousand dollars or five hundred thousand dollars of of technology or we're going to re reprioritize and make that decision as a system now that's on April 2nd that that's gonna you know we're gonna look at that and make that decision um, so we didn't get all the way through 37 we're halfway through 37 On 36, I thought that three pre and vehicles would be a little bit less than 60,000, probably. It, whatever it is, you know, I, we didn't go out and price them. It could be. Um, Our the, vehicles right now have 300,000 miles on a piece. Yeah, uh, I see that. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, the wheels fell off one. It's one of those. Yeah, I'm not questioning the need. We for are them. happy to take pre owned, amount. and if we can get it under 20,000 a piece, obviously we would. Um, we do want to be concerned about having a vehicle that's large enough to carry equipment. Well, you could probably almost get new work vans for that. Um, you know, the ones that are just the shells and whatnot. But okay, on 37, the computer lease, I'm curious why it's in this list because that's just a separate pocket of money, right? It's still technology. Um, and we could, we could, we used to do it that way. Um, but I'm I, used to seeing it's just separate. Mm -hmm. It was like on top of the list, double line, here's the rest of it. There were, there were a lot of questions about should that really be used for the renewal or should it be used for servers or should it be... And so we thought it should be put in as technology and let's, let's let the committee look at it. Well, it doesn't say what this is for. And I think the rest, what I'm concerned about is everything else gives us a clear description of what it is. And this doesn't say what 37 is going to be spent on. Oh, okay. So at that item you would like, and, and I think you're correct, Ms. Burton Ball, let me just add, if it, we do renew the schools next year, it would be Northwest High, Odell. Let me put that in and, and how many specific computers it would be. Yeah, and, and, and even I know you've been working on some virtual ways session. to get more out of that money. Correct. So, you know, I would just ask that you put a little description there instead of it just being that big lump. And, so and I clear. think it, when it got transferred over as being separate and it just said lease, but I, I do yeah. agree. We'll go ahead and put some clarification in there. Okay. And then down on 39, um, it says bulb replacement. <laughs> Is that the projectors for the smart boards and things? Yes, those that bulbs. That has to move up. Otherwise, we have all this technology people can't use. Well, right? the schools are currently buying their own right now, right? Currently, the schools are buying. Uh, you know, we, we've been giving them money for ink. It's not the full amount that they need, and they use uh, instructional monies for that, and they've been buying their own uh, bulbs. Yeah, I'm more concerned about the bulbs because all of a sudden we have a tool in a classroom that is not usable if the school because not every school is going to be able to afford it so and, and then I, if we have the same issue though with the network so we have networks that are dying and the, and the schools are saying I can't even boot up the computers and so I, that was the trouble the, the committee had trouble waiting that they going how, how do we well honestly I guess I, I would like to ask the 39 be split and I know Ms. Blackwell you were probably in those meetings but can we split 39 and, and the, the ink I think is more elective because they can go use the duplicator and whatnot. They don't have to be printing stuff off. They can print one copy and go use the duplicator, which is cheaper to use. Um, but I'm concerned about that bulb replacement that we have these $5,000 investments per classroom for smart boards and all the associated equipment, and they're rendered unfunctional because of a bulb. Let, let me tell you the history of those line items. There was a line item for 100000 for bulb, and there was a line item for 100000 for ink. And mm -hmm. we couldn't do either one of them. Mm -hmm. So the, the principal in the, in the room said, just give me discretion on what to spend the money on and combine them and cut it in half instead of 200 yeah. give me 100 Are the schools buying all their own replacement parts or are we buying them as a group? 
In terms of the ink, uh, at, per your request two years ago, we've consolidated those services. In terms of the bulbs, we can't stock those from the issue that they, even if you have them sitting in a box for three or four months, they, they, they wear. Um, so we do have a sp specific vendor that we've gone out for pricing, but the schools do order them individually. Okay. Well, I, my thought is I'd like to see that bulb replacement because, like I said, I don't want to render that... Um, all that equipment sitting very nicely in there for a teacher to have to wait three months to get a bulb. So, and that those bulbs are very expensive. The good thing is um, the life of those bulbs now is up to about three or four thousand hours, whereas two or three years ago they were about a thousand hours. So they're getting more efficient. But well, one good thing also, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but on the accumulative on the far right there, mm -hmm. those are not exact numbers. And I'm sure that that's probably a conservative number other than the leases, which is pretty much close. And so there very well could be overages in the accumulative there that could push us down further into the list. And to, uh, to go along with Ms. what Ms. Furtenbaugh has said, that, um, you know, we do need to make provisions for the bulbs. It's no, I, mean, I don't want to be redundant of what Ms. Furtenbaugh has already said, but somehow or another that needs to be uh, taken in consideration some way. So Although, your recommendation yeah. would be to move 39 to like number 37? And just well, I'm thinking it just needs to be moved up, and then okay. any excess money from the cumulative could move down the list further. But I think that needs to be a little bit higher of a priority and sh for sure don't need to be left out. But uh, I'd welcome any other comments from the board at this time. Well, I've just got one quick one. But this list went through the Trego process. So in the voting and the holding up the cards and the numbers, that's where it yeah, hit? Yeah, you see the, the numbers that are beside the description, but before the um, the dollar amount, the, like, the... Yes. Those are the Trego values. Hmm. So, I mean, obviously, I, I, I think uh, Ms. Furtenbaugh is right. It's like having a car and nobody can find the key you know it's parked and you can't use it but, <laughs> but well if you don't have if you yeah but it's not that there's not monies there for the bulbs right. it's in a different area it's not that we've not had money in there it's now out of the school's particular pockets and into technology it's not that they're not going to get them it's just would be if we can do it it will be done in a different manner well i guess that's where we i was going clarification that, on that for sure that if it didn't rate higher up that there must be some sort of contingency plan or something because I didn't think they would accept having them where they couldn't use them. The, uh, that's where I was going. On the tech committee, the principals, um, one of their concerns was hearing from principals who said, you know, the computers in my school are old. They're six or seven years old, but the networks are so slow that it takes 15 or 20 minutes for the kids to boot up, and the teachers have trouble with the computer and the smart board. They said that that was of a greater priority than funding the bulbs and the ink. What they said was, in the past, uh, ADM monies that came in for instruction, yes, we used to do a lot of dittos and we used to make a lot of worksheets but we've become so interactive with the smart boards we're willing to take our instructional money and put it towards the bulbs as opposed to the way we used to spend it okay board members any other questions yeah, mr. chair I had yes. actually one more question before we pass it down there um, that scholarship plus I remember that when I was attending all the detailed budget meetings last year that we had said, why don't we just pay for that all together instead of we're kind of nickel and diming the schools to come up with the money. Um, and I just want to amend that that software is used not just to track scholarships awarded. That software is primarily used to offer the scholarships for the parents and students to view. And then it tracks later. But it's also, it's that communication mechanism that we've so often talked about parents needing the information. So. Um, Fifteen hundred dollars is is an eight point two high or low on the priority scale? It's low. So the higher the number, the lower it is. Okay. And the high school principal on the committee stated, um, when you go through the trico process and you look at what's needed for the system versus what's needed for the individual school, said that the cost of this per school it was three hundred dollars or two fifty. I can go ahead and pay for that as opposed to taking it out of the system budget. Okay, because last year was a lot more. Did it go down in price? I was thinking it was like upwards of a thousand per school, which is why we said toss it back in our. Um, that this is a budget item from Donna Smith, and we had the quote, and it was for fifteen hundred for the for the whole for, system for the whole system. Okay. That's fine. I mean, if they can handle, I just don't want to see that not get purchased. So, okay. Okay.
Okay, Ms. Monnett, do you have any comments, or Ms. Carpenter, or Mr. Tiger? Okay, yeah. then. Okay. <laughs> uh, and, and I just want verification. This is what we, the wonderful thing that they've got on the scholarships, listing the new web page and all this for the scholarships? Yes. Okay, I'm with Cindy on this. That is a wonderful, wonderful tool because uh, I was one that really went after this because I served on two scholarship committees and we it has really really helped getting parents involved where they could go and look on the site to help get scholarships for their children and I know it really helped us we were not getting a lot of applications for the committees that I, I was serving on and it helped us start getting applications for more students and it really improved our actual web page and I would hate to see us lose that uh, for $1,500 I would like to see it move up uh, for that amount because it really has improved our page tremendously and it's a big help for the parents out there it's made it so so much easier can I I need clarification on two items so on this item is it the pleasure of the board that this item would be moved up or is it okay that the schools have agreed that, to continue funding it as they have and the schools would continue their $250 yeah, that's the clarification that needs to be made. They're not falling off of any They're budget. still going to use it. They're still going to be there. It's not oh, that okay. it's going to go away. It's just being paid in a different mannerism. We're no, taking as long it. As it's paid for. Yes, it's not going to go anywhere. It's just that if we can accommodate that versus taking it out of schools, individual bu budgets, that's what we we're going to do. But if it's not, if we're not able to afford this, then it's going to go back onto the schools' budgets. So there's nothing going to go away. Um, but if, you know, we need to reprioritize remember this process went through the same thing that y'all are doing with the regular budget committee so same system same situation and then I need to have direction please from the board on the bulb replacement slash ink is that item to be moved forward or is that another one uh, that we would continue to work with the principals and make sure that uh, they would use instructional monies I, I would like to suggest that we it can stay there as long as we, I'd like to see something set within technology that says, uh, and it's maybe it's with the local school TFs, but that there's a service level agreement in business, that's what we have in SLA that says you have to do things within a certain amount of time. So, for example, that there be a, an SLA that a teacher is never without their smart board equipment for more than five class days, not a couple months, but if we're waiting for a bulb, get it. <laughs> so and that's what I don't I don't I've heard that multiple times that we've had equipment sitting idle waiting for a part and sometimes it's just the bulb if it's so. the bulb then I need to be aware of those situations because our vendor has a 24-hour de delivery so I, I need to know of those situations mr. Kiger you had a comment well, I was just gonna say in answer to your question I, I'm I guess I'm of the opinion just leave it alone and and, and, and be true to the process that has taken place up to this point if we get further into the process and see that something needs to be addressed then then we'll address it at that time but as for in my opinion for your direction right now I'd say just leave it alone okay. Ms. Carpenter uh, well my concern now is this coming actually out of the supply fund because that actual if it's coming out of that that has been tapped so much and I know so many schools I mean paper for instance, all of them are screaming, I don't have paper to copy on. Is it coming out of that fund? Um, it would be any school resource that they had. There's um, for transcript fees or parking lot fees or whatever fee that they choose to take that from, uh, you know, instructional supply fee. They have a lot of options at the school. I'm not, they're not wealthy by any stretch of the imagination, um, but they can, they do have options. And we didn't in, we didn't feel an indication that it was a huge burden for them in the committee okay miss probes on item 35 there uh, can you address that just a little bit uh, do, do we currently have two engineers or are we looking for one or can you um, you're well aware of the fact that um, Adam Harkey resigned last fall and working with Ms. Auger and the salary committee, 
um, we've reposted that position as a systems engineer hoping to bring something to you uh, recommendation next Monday evening. The second, we did have a vacancy with what we called our WAN engineer, um, and I, I believe I've let you know about that one. Um, we've posted that as a network position, a network engineer. The, what you see on 35 is a recommendation for an additional engineer. In the last 12 years, there's not been any gains in the engineering staff. Uh, and they do an incredible job with 15,000 endpoints and 43 sites. Um, and right now we have three engineers. So our, the committee felt very strongly that there were issues on getting the, the, what the teachers need and what the schools need and adding an engineer position. Ms. Brannon at the county is also taking this position. So you'll see it on our budget request, plus you'll see it on the county budget position. Uh, request as well as Kannapolis. What um, we'd like to do on this position is hire somebody to work with all three agencies, all of us perhaps pulling money together to hire one position, um, especially when we work with the networks. That projected cost there, would that be with the Cabarrus County Schools absorbing the full cost of the engineer? Uh, with this one right here on 35 would be if we personally hire that position and it's not with Kannapolis and it's not with the county. If we merge together and hire one position together and share that position, then Ms. Klutz would be working with um, Cabarrus and Kannapolis. I don't know whether we do the 80-20 rule with Kannapolis, but I don't know how that works when you put the mix in with uh, Cabarrus also, but well, it would be less. Well, it only seems feasible to me that uh, if uh, Rather than hiring three, if we could hire one and that one person be utilized by all three entities, it would seem like it would be more uh, economical to me. That's and therefore, you know, bring the cumulative that we have deeper into <coughs> what we have here based on Trago. If you and that's what we felt. We felt very strongly that if we could combine that. But that does not replace the engineer that we've lost, and we do need to have someone on site. Uh, in our department to replace. But now those funds are already allocated though, is that yes, correct? Yes, yes okay. sir. So that won't affect this. But that okay. this number could definitely come down. And you had mentioned about the numbers and whether they, I don't think you used the word soft, but I will tell you that about 90% of these numbers are the exact quotes. The ones like on the vehicle or this engineer, anything that we're working together with the county, those numbers could come down. Yeah, well, if we were just off off by 10% to our good, you know, you could see that would be $300,000, which would cover the bulbs and a couple other little things there. Uh, but as you mentioned earlier, that we only got halfway through 37. Mm -hmm. So then they'd have to be some decisions made. Are we going to continue? Well, well, the leases obviously have to be paid. So there's not really much option there, in my opinion. But, uh, but anyway, uh, we do need to decide what uh, Mr. Kiger made the recommendation that we just leave it as it is. And do I have any other comments, uh, reference, um, moving the bulbs, leave it where it is? run it back through the budget committee, um, technology budget committee for uh, further guidance from them or what do you, what's your pleasure? Mr. Chairman, I, I agree with Mr. Kiger to leave it as is. I feel like we need to stay true to our process. This is what we're doing with our regular budget committee. But I do like Ms. Furtenbaugh's suggestion of the <coughs> SLA or whatever, however Service you're doing. Yes, um, Dr. Probst, because it does seem like there's some issues with the individual schools mm -hmm. maybe not getting those requests in a timely manner. And we wouldn't know that as a technology committee. So, you know, that does seem to be a problem. But that's a system problem, not a technology committee problem as far as I'm concerned. I do have one more question. The Trigo numbers are not in ascending or descending order. So how did those get out of order? By level. So if it's a level zero, it's the, the Trigos are in order by level. Because if, if it's required and mandatory, then it's required. No, I'm looking at just the page with, with number 35 to 40 on it. They're in one level. But the numbers would as, should ascend, and they don't. Do you, in the TRIGO process with the risk indicators, after we TRIGOed, then we went back with the risk indicators, and the committee could dialogue about each one of these and decide whether to change the order of the priority. I think you all risk, can you did that last spring with the final budget when you came in with the risk, risk analysis. Yeah, I guess I, you know, I'm hearing stay true to the TRIGO process, but yet the numbers, we're not, we don't see the data that indicates why they were moved. 
Okay, so. that is part of the tree goal is the risk analysis and the ability for the committee to say, okay, this is the way the numbers fell out, but based on other information, you're correct. We have that information in our minutes from the meeting, but not on this sheet. But I can certainly go ahead and say why we put this one above another one, if that if that would help. Um, I, yeah, well, I mean, I don't. We don't need to go through that now. I'm just kind of curious because I don't. Um, unfortunately, these meetings are very long during my work day, so I can't be here. But um, I, I wouldn't necessarily agree with how some of these things were moved. So, anyways, I, I will say one thing about the committee. What was very interesting about the committee is that they all came as individuals, and they have their own needs at their schools, or they see things as a system. What they say stayed true was th that we do whatever we can to that strate strategic plan of trying to get equity amongst all the schools. And that became a focus of trying to meet that strategic initiative of making sure that we don't end up with schools that are haves and schools that are have nots. So I was very proud of them um, and the way they work together. Mr. Furr, do you have some comments? The uh, only comment I have is uh, I agree with Mr. Kiger. We need to stay true to this uh, process and uh, and not to and try not to burden the schools because when you burden the schools you burden the parents and uh, we need to try to leave it on the budget okay I think that's what we want to do and so that's how we'll leave it thank you miss probes and miss clutch you're going to move on up to the construction budget and uh, we'll cover that and get right back on course We're not having a lot of activity right now. There's a, a change to Winkler for $11,000. Um, Mr. Kiger had a question. I went and looked that up. That really is just them, the school spending the remaining furniture and equipment money. Um, we had a deadline of February 29th for those dollars, and we depleted those. Um, but other than that, there's just very little change on this report. Are there any questions from the board? Mr. Chairman, when is the money going back to the county? When are we saying we're done? Um, there was an approved list um, from the county that had some minor um, uh, things on it from Mr. Whitkey that he got an extension for. Um, so other than there, those, there's um, some land and some contingency, and those dollars will definitely go back. Um, but when? Uh, June, 1st. June 1st. Okay. What, I, I'm guessing it would be beneficial if the county knew they were getting it sooner than later since they're in their budget process as well. Wouldn't that be a good neighbor thing really? to do? Uh, no, they made the date. Huh? The extension? The county commissioners just approved that, so they are the ones that know. They just did it on their agenda. Okay, so they approved the extension? Yes, they, they approved, approved the extension, extension and they set the date. Okay. Well, the only thing is they were several projects, and just like, for, for example, Boger Elementary, we got 370000 that we're waiting on the tax sales tax refund on, but that'll never come to us anyway. That will go straight to the county. Is no, that we, right? No, we've already utilized those funds. We're okay. done. With okay, Boger. so, well, why do we still have it on here then? That's we why, can take that off. Yeah, well, that's what was my curiosity, yeah. why we still have it when it's already closed out, and yeah, um, so we need to remove that one. We, yeah, we can definitely okay. do that. For All right. You. Any other questions from the board on the construction budget? Thank you, Ms. Klutz. Well, I, well, oh. Excuse me. What will they? What will the county actually be getting dollar wise? What will they actually be getting back? You see the um, budget balance there in the middle. That 1.8 million dollars on Her Harold Winkler. They're going to get most of that. And that's Mm -hmm. La that's mostly land and contingency. And that's for that road, right? Or what we said was going yes. to be for that road. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Well, Ms. Klutz, I think that's it for you tonight okay. on that part anyway. Thank you. All right, so board members, we're going to move right along. Uh, let me get where we're supposed to be. We're going to have um, 4.03 with Jason. 
And Jason, if you'd come to the podium and tell us about the 2010-2011 academic rankings. members of the board um, tonight I'm going to present to you the academic rankings from 2009 2010 um, you've seen the scale score rankings already but uh, they don't give out or you've seen the scale score numbers um, in the fall <clears throat> but the rankings don't come out till mid-February where they actually compile the data and we are able to see where we stand in comparison to other counties when we look at data we try to analyze it under three venues one is we try to compare it to the standard which is our proficiency data did the kids pass the test were they proficient then we also try to compare growth and that's individual students so did students grow from year to year and then we also tried or we also compare to other schools and other school systems to see if we're growing at the same rate as other school systems and how we compare based on our demographics and and uh, makeup so the first slide there is really, um, I'm going to just talk from that, um, that kind of highlights the celebrations and OFIs, um, opportunities for improvement. We do have uh, some really, I think, neat things to celebrate in Cabarrus County in our ranking. Obviously, this is tied to our strategic plan and a desire by the board to be in the top 10 uh, for uh, academic rankings for our students. And um, you uh, are, should be happy to know that our U.S. history uh, scores are in the top 10, um, and they have been for the last four years. So that is something to definitely celebrate at our high schools. Uh, I also want to congratulate our eighth grade teams across the county. Um, as you know from the middle school concept, there's a, a team mentality with the, with the teachers. Um, all of our eighth grade kids are in the, I, sh I should say this, our eighth grade scores are all in the top 25. Okay, so our science, our reading, and math are in the top 25. That speaks highly of our 8th grade teams. And in addition to that, in the elementary school, all of our 5th grade uh, measurements increased in, in ranking. Science, reading, and math all increased in ranking. So we want to celebrate them. I sent them all some really congratulatory emails uh, when we got this data saying thank you for their hard work. Um, on the opportunities for improvement side, <clears throat> um, one of the major things that we are investigating right now is the fourth grade math. Um, the reason why that points out to us, it's the only academic category of all of our data that's below the state average. So um, it kind of sticks out there, and we're curious to find out why that might be. Um, we also, when you look at fourth grade and seventh grade, you, you really see, when you look at the historical data, you see a five-year flat line in their ranking data. So we're doing some root cause analysis with our directors to kind of see what's going on in our fourth grade and seventh grade um, classrooms. I don't know if the board wants me to go through the, the entire rankings. I tried to summarize here on the first slide, but we can go through one by one if you want. I think um, that we'd probably just for you to do a summation, Jason, because yeah. we've had this since last week. And okay. if I could, we can address any questions that the board might have for any particular item before you move forward. Board members, you have any questions on the celebrations or the opportunities for improvement for Jason before we move forward? Mr. Chairman, I just had, I'm curious, mm -hmm. has there been any observation that the increased class sizes over the past couple years has had some effect? I haven't looked at the data in light of that. Um, that second PDF file that you see there on the board, not, uh, not this PowerPoint, but the second PDF there in Board Docs um, has a nice one-page sampler of all the data. So, you know, if we were to look at that in light of increased class size, I'm just going to pick one. Um, third grade reading, you know, in 2008 was 17th in the state. Um, then it jumped to 33 and then 37. However, in fifth grade reading, um, we were at 48 in 2008. Then we uh, dropped down to 34 and then down to 24th. So their data is actually increasing while third grade is decreasing. Um, and third grade, we have to remember, has that, that does have a cap. So third grade has a state mandatory cap of 1 to 24, whereas your fifth grade class sizes are up. Some are 29 or 30. So, um, and that is consistent with the national research on class size. It, 
you know, only for very specific demographic groups. And if you get under 17, 18 kids in a class, does it uh, have much influence on test data? That's a good, good point. Yeah, I'm thinking more on the things like the the reading. I could see mm -hmm. where it wouldn't, but I'm thinking when I look at the algebra, you know, one increase, and that algebra is probably <clears throat> a mixture of middle yeah. school and high school right, it is. takers, and then the math um, down below, by and large, we lost ranking on the math. So I would just think that math classes would be more impacted perhaps by a I don't think all yeah. subjects are equal. You right. know, some just like in college, some lectures you can mm -hmm. go to a history class and have three hundred in it, and it makes no difference as if you had twenty kids in that class. Correct. It's different. Yeah. So, yeah, where math is not. Yeah, yeah, for that individual effect. Okay, Jason, you want to move on to the middle school portion? That was that was every that that was a K twelve summary right there. So. Okay, you did the summary. Yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. I was I was scrolling on down through the other uh, numbers there for the reading and for the uh, the math and all. But I, okay, all right, board members, we have any further questions for Jason? Reference this report. Okay, if none, then Jason, we thank you for the report and for the time you took to get it ready for us. Thank you. I'd like to ask uh, Chris Louder to come to the podium. He's going to give us the. Uh, Consolidated Data State Report on Suspensions and Dropouts. Dr. Louder. Good evening. I am going to report to you tonight on the State Consolidated Data Report. Um, it's about a 150-page report that um, essentially has three parts. It, it um, consolidates the reportable offenses for um, the state suspensions short term and long term and also the dropout rate or one of the ways that the state reports dropout rate I know you guys have had this before too so I don't want to read it to you just want to say the um, the 17 offenses that are reportable there are 10 that are considered dangerous and violence they're listed right here before you on this slide Chris, and then there's seven the, excuse me for the uh, uh, benefit of the viewing audience would you mind buzzing through those 10 offenses there that are the most uh... yes the 10 dangerous and violent acts are homicide assault resulting in serious bodily injury assault involving the use of a weapon rape sexual offense sexual assault kidnapping robbery with a dangerous weapon robbery without a dangerous weapon and taking indec indecent liberties with a minor and then there are seven additional acts that um, are all acts 17 that have to be reported to the state. The other seven are assault on school personnel, a bomb threat, burning of a school building, possession of alcoholic beverage, possession of a controlled substance in violation of the law, and possession, possession of a firearm or powerful explosive, and possession of a weapon. Um, and just as a state summary, first we have the state summary and then we have information about Cabarrus County. The number of acts of those crime and violence increased by 0.4% statewide. 86% of all the acts, again, this is statewide, involve possession of a controlled substance, a weapon, or alcoholic beverages. So you can see that's the vast majority of the things that are actually reported to the state. And then we broke down by elementary, middle, and high, again, the state summary of what, what the offenses are by each grade level. And then the way they try to equate these when we have different size school districts is to say, what are the number of reportable acts per 1,000 students? And they usually report that in grades 9 through 12. So you can see um, that for this past year, and this report is for 2010, 2011, Cabarrus had 11.25 per, per 1,000 students. And even though Kannapolis is a much smaller district, they try to equate that um, by per 1,000 students. Then the second part of the report is about suspensions, long-term and short-term. And so I just included in this chart um, the number over the past three years of short-term and long-term suspensions in our county and in several of the surrounding counties. As we go, or do we want to wait to the end? Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. Uh, to it doesn't matter. Mr. Louder, you want to just address the questions as they sure, come? Sure, yeah. yeah. Whatever's better for you guys. Well, I, I guess, I'm, I'm sorry, I should have asked that before, but that point four that came up before mm -hmm. of the increase, do you know what that n number has 
That I mean, just on the surface, it seems like a fairly low number, but I don't have anything to compare it to. Do you know what maybe last year's number was or what that historic? I don't have it in front. They reported out that way with a total number. That it's it's in the report. I mean, I can send it to okay. you to be honest well, with you. Well, I, I, I maybe should have asked that prior to to let you give you a chance to look at it. So I'm sorry to put you on the spot. Oh, that's okay. That that does. Uh, I'd be curious to know. Mr. Chair, yes, Ms. are we going to discuss the uh, fact that we have s a significantly higher number of long-term suspensions? Yes, Ms. Bonnet, when uh, Mr. Louder gets to that, which is what he's coming up to now, and um, he gave us a preference to this uh, on our Friday report, I believe it was, you know, covered it a little bit, but I've asked him to cover it again since the number is significantly higher. And he's going to tell us why it's higher and the justification for it. Yeah, as soon as those numbers come back, that was my first reaction too as well. It looks like we have a lot more long-term suspensions than most of the other districts, um, especially around us. And what after we got that number, I kind of made sure we found out from other districts to find out maybe what was different about what we did that other districts did that might explain the difference in that number. And what I found from talking to, to all the districts that we talked to, to be honest with you, is most school districts when someone um, is involved with one of these offenses we talked about before, the easiest example may be to say when someone brings marijuana to school. If somebody brings marijuana to school, most school districts around us simply refer those students to the alternative school. So they are not recommended for a long-term suspension. The consequence is you get transferred to the alternative school. What we do in Cabarrus County is the principal says, well, I'm going to, if a student brings marijuana to school, you say, I'm going to recommend a long-term suspension. Um, if the student, and, and then that can be appealed and goes through the process, but most of the students in Cabarrus County end up at the alternative school for the same reason. So if 12 days later, a student enrolls at the alternative school in Cabarrus County, they'll go to the Glenn Center and be at the alternative school, but that student would count as a long-term suspension for us. The county next door, where they just referred them to the Glenn Center, would not count as a long-term suspension, but the consequence is exactly the same. Does that make sense? Um, so the best explanation I have for the difference in those numbers is that, that they have a number of offenses, many of them on some, even on some of their web pages, um, when they list their code of conduct, never use the term long-term suspension. It just says referral to alternative school. And we long-term suspend and then ultimately refer to the alternative school. So it seems like we have an extra step that often puts the number up, if, if that makes sense. Okay, board members, uh, just for your information, Mr. Louder and I talked about this just briefly, and that's, this is an issue that I feel like that we need to address a little bit more because a lot of time and resources is, is expended in the what process that we're doing right now. And so I'd like to hear some discussion from the board on this, and we'll start with Mr. Furr. Um, only thing I can really add to it is uh, I think we need to change our process or our uh, we need to take a hard look at it, and or we need to change how we report it to, to be on the same page as everyone else. Okay, thank you, Mr. Furr. Mr. Burtonbaugh and Tim, I mean, uh, Chris, we're going to come back to the rest of this report as sure. we cover this issue here. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, Dr. Lott, I, I agree that if we're doing something that different, you know, to me, that it's not only a staff efficiency issue. Um, we have lawyers involved in appeals we have all kinds of expenses associated with appeals and in addition that puts a mark on a student's record when maybe there is you know we've seen some activities where it was questionable if that student really had intent or understood what was occurring but yet they have the long-term suspension on their record so I would like to for us to take a serious review and, and let Chris you know recommend how we can change that and then just one further comment, too, that I, as I was thinking, and, and I don't know how some of you are, but when I come up with a thought, I have to tell you, or I'll forget it, time it gets my turn. <laughs> but what happens is, though, and this is the other side of the coin, Ms. Furtenbaugh, and that would be, you know, we're talking about possibly following a process that neighboring counties are using. But what comes with that, though, is additional personnel at the Glenn Center, that type thing. And so when you look at the resources expended to uh, fulfill the process as we have it, versus the process of additional personnel, I don't know which way it'd go, but all of that would need to be taken into consideration, though, and how in the world you would project how many kids are going to be going to the Glenn Center based on whatever we come up with would be beyond me, but you guys have a way of figuring it out. Ms. Furtenbaugh. Well, Mr. Chair, I think 
this also would be a good time to look at how the Glenn Center is implemented. And it may be that there almost need to be classrooms uh, based on a fence because we've, you know, we've heard of parental concern about students who were um, there for really nonviolent, uh, just things they did unto themselves, if you will, versus kids who have hurt someone else. So either with the threat or real a fight or something. So, and they didn't want their kids mixed. But I think it would be a good time to look at that program and see how it can be more effective if we add students to it. Thank you, Ms. Furtenbaugh. Ms. Blackwell. Um, I definitely agree that we need to take a look at it. I also, it's been my concern with the appeals, the amount of time these kids are out of school. I mean, if they got an automatic referral, we would accommodate getting them into classes. I think that's a huge benefit uh, for the student. They don't lose class time. But this is a good time also with the budget committee. You know, if we're going to have to look at something additional for the Glenn Center, or, you know, if those numbers are going to increase, I, I'm not even sure. Well, I don't think we've even ever gotten a report about it. are they half full, three quarters full, you know, where the uh, numbers are, for the number of children that are out there at any given time. But maybe we can look at it to set those parameters of the offenses, um, like Ms. Burtonball was referencing, um, you know, that this offense automatically goes without any question, but the, maybe something else would be, a, a, you know, follow the appeal process. Right. But I definitely think we need to look at it and get some of those parameters in place. Thank you, Ms. Blackwelder. Mr. Kiger, you want to carry on? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I guess I'm a firm believer in having a good reason for doing what you're doing. So part of the, the analysis to me would be to try to figure out how is it that we set up to do it this way as opposed to another way? There, there might be a very good reason why we intended to do that in the first place, and I don't necessarily want to change something just to make our numbers look good, right. you know, or different. Maybe not good It's not the right word, but different because to me that's just, you know, trying to put window dressing or looking something that's symbolic. There, there's, there's a reason why this, we, we've got the, the situation that we do and the, 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 the process is in place. If we come to find out, and I'm 100% I'm in favor of giving you the, the uh, ability to go out and research and try to figure this out, and if we find out we do need to make a change, then at least we're doing it with the, the knowledge in hand that, we, well, that's where we were, and that's why we've got there, but here's where we've got to go. And I think Ms. Furtenbaugh is absolutely right. This is a good opportunity to, to really analyze the Glenn Center of, of what we're doing and how we're doing it and how uh, uh, how we need to move forward over there. Thank you, Mr. Kiger. Mr. Carpenter. Well, I know how Tim feels now. They've all said it, Tim. Um, I agree. <laughs> uh, I think that we do need to look at it. And I don't think it's just a numbers thing because I know many times when we've heard hearing, had hearings and heard the, the, the people that have come before us, a lot of times it's been something that the child or maybe just did something that they shouldn't have done and they went through about attorneys in here a lot of money time was spent maybe that didn't need to be and they could have gone my only concern is and that's where I think we really maybe need to look at what courses are offered maybe additional courses may maybe would need to be there uh, and there may have to be adjustments there at the Glen Center and this is because right now I, you know, I don't know if we're offering what would need to be. We may need to do something different, and I would want to make sure that was done. Um, and I agree with uh, uh, Mr. Kiger that we need to make, why did we do it that way to start with? I, I'd like to see the history of that, why we did do it that way to begin with. Uh, a lot of you, and you maybe know why that was done. I would like to see the history and why we did that to start with instead of just jumping and say, oh yes, well let's do like everybody else has, is, is doing. Uh, I would want to make sure of that beforehand. But I do think we do need, I, I look at our, our attorney's down there, I think he may know. Uh, <laughs> he say, yeah, 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 I know. Um, and you could fill me in on that because I, I would like to know why it was done that way to begin with. Um, and, uh, I, and I'll let you speak to that because I would like to know it, was it a recommendation from the state? Was it some other reason that we did that? Um, but I, I do think we need to, to explore this. I, mean, I, I think it's been an evolving process. I, I'd say 
you know, 20 years ago, there were not alternative schools widely available. Most systems didn't have any alternative, and it was simply suspension. Um, and then there was a move to, and a requirement ultimately in 115.391 that you consider alternative education if available. And that's when you had alternative schools. Although originally, they were not kind of a full standard course of study option. It was a partial, you could get a few credits um, and go there. You could not transfer a student to a program that did not offer a regular course of study. So if you were, if you, when you had the, the opportunity school or as originally constructed, you would still, you could offer it as an alternative, but it would not just be an administrative transfer. Over time though, many schools, and we've offered more and more courses there, have really developed those into alternative placements that are not that different from a magnet school or what you might get somewhere else where it really is an administrative transfer. That's what some of the other districts are doing. They're saying just like we can move you from student, from school A to student to school B for disciplinary reasons, we're moving you from school A to the opportunity school as a consequence. It's not a suspension. You still have access uh, to the full course. And I do think that's the way a lot of districts are going. And I hear the board saying that's something to explore here, which makes sense. And we've had some preliminary discussions already with Colleen uh, and Dr. Shepard about moving in that direction. We do need to look at making sure the Opportunity School has the available courses so we can say, yes, your child's being moved there, but they'll still be able to stay on track and with the standard course of study. And I think we've moved in that direction as we've added stuff. And obviously, there's a population issue making sure you've got the right folks. But I think that I do think that's a, the right approach. And it gives us that option to say, we're simply changing the school where you're learning. You're still going to be in your classes and learn, but it's going to be at the opportunity school for the rest of the year. Then you don't have the long hearing process and the record and all the other issues that the board's raised. So I think that, that but that's the evolution in history. Uh, the idea of opportunity school wasn't even around um, 20, 20 years ago. You, your only choice was suspension. Thank you, Mark, for your comments. Uh, Ms. Minitz, you have some comments? Well, I won't belabor it because I agree with everybody else on the panel. It's just that the minute I saw that, I did not see numbers. I saw children. And we're in the process of helping children and to just let them be on their own is not helping children. It's not helping our community either. So I, I hope that we can really have a good study of that, come back with some suggestions. Thank you, Ms. Smiley, and thank you all the board members for your comments. Mr. Louder, if you want to continue on with the report, thank you. Uh, then just have a chart with the short-term suspensions. And again, this is per 100 students, and this is how the state reports it in 912. And you can see there in short term, it's, it's much, um, a much better comparison there. We're actually better than, than all but one of the districts as far as the number of short-term suspensions. So again, it points to a little bit of maybe that we're a little bit out of sync in, in the other area. Um, just as a summary for Cabarrus County, our total reportable acts decreased from 129 to 94. Um, again, this was past this past school year. Long-term suspensions for the system decreased from 218 to 201. And short-term suspensions actually increased from 3479 to 3988. The last part of that state report is actually dropout report. And this is a little bit confusing because the state reports drop out two ways. Um, I don't want to confuse you, but I also want to make sure you understand it because it comes out, and this was just released in right at the beginning of February. Um, one, when they report that we have, that Cabarrus County, for example, had a 2.57% dropout rate, what they do there is take the amount of seniors when they begin their senior year and how many of those seniors actually graduate. And that's where, that's where 2.57 comes from. The number that's reported in the summer is the cohort graduation rate, which ultimately says these kids that began school in ninth grade, how many of them actually graduated four years later? And many states were reporting things along the line of the graduation rate, and the federal government came out about four or five, well, five or six years ago and said, stop doing that. Report the real thing, which is how many begin in ninth grade and how many are four years later. But because many states had been doing it this way, they report both. And it actually confuses people a little bit. But I want you to at least understand what that is. It does come out. It was reported February 2nd. And what I included there was withdrawals. Withdrawals are actually the amount of students, for again, for 10-11, we had 310 withdrawals. Those are the amount of students that withdraw from school 
um, that were not sure enrolled somewhere else. That number usually gets smaller. So for example, when that says 310 down to 225, if a student today moved to California, withdrew and went to California, um, they may be in California for a month or so before they actually enroll in a school. For that month, they're considered a dropout. They're a withdrawal and we don't know where they are. But as soon as they withdraw in a school and we can report that to the state, then they drop off of that list. Again, I know this can be a little bit confusing, but withdrawals for uh, as, as the person that's working the closest with the dropout rate, that's my, my best indicator throughout the year of where we're at and how we're doing. So we try to monitor that. Then when you drop down to the number of dropouts and the dropout percent, that's that number of seniors that, that I explained to you before and how they come to, how they come to that percentage. Um, and again, this is the, our dropout rate that they're reporting in February. Um, for the last three years in comparison to the districts around us. And then right now the state average in that is 3.43. Our average is 2.57, which is the rank of 23rd um, in the state. And right now I work with the graduation coaches and at the end of first semester, I actually got the number after this was submitted to you guys. Um, right now we've had 129 students 9, 10, 11, and 12 that have actually dropped out this school year, which is actually 10 less than we had last school year, even though we have more students. So that's a good number. That's still way too many as far as who's going to be there. But again, that looks good, but that's a moving target that we could get to. So because someone can walk in and drop out tomorrow, it's a hard thing to, to wrap your head around, but we try to get every indicator we can to give us our best information by the time we get to the end of the school year. Okay, thank you, Mr. Louder. So uh, whereas what we've got now is you're going to look into, you're going to start the process with Mr. Enriquez about the uh, long-term suspensions, and I suppose you'll be bringing us some type of recommendation in the next couple of months on this. Is that right? Yes, sir. Right, well, will this, <laughs> yeah, will this be going through? The, will this also uh, be involved with the policy committee? I'm sure it will be. I think it probably will be. I mean, part of it is is a practice of looking at transfers as opposed to suspensions. But I think we'll be looking at policy as well. Okay. We did meet with all the high school and middle school principals. Um, and they were all in full support. We haven't had anybody object to it. So I think along with what Mr. Cogger's point was, you know, that it's not we're not changing things to make it look better. If that's right. what if that's what happens, that's what happens. But if we're off in the way we code things compared to other people, we want to make sure our principals know that they can control their schools and have safe schools, and they were com you know completely support this because it's more a matter of coding than it is what the action they well, take. We need to be able to compare apples to apples instead right. of apples to oranges, that type thing. I think Dr. Shepard wanted to make a comment where the, about the Glenn Center part, particularly. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just uh, so many good things that you already said tonight in discussing this issue. One. Uh, I just want to report or repeat that we do look at, at, at all these statistics as numbers, but then we, we quickly turn our attention to the fact that each number represents a child, as Ms. Monnett said. And, and so we, um, and I think one point that, that I would want you to, to note in your suspensions, uh, long-term and short-term, is that though those numbers might be of concern, particularly for long-term, we have an incredibly safe school district in comparison to other districts around us, and we don't want to tweak things to the point where that that fluctuates at all. We want to maintain our very safe school district. If it means that more students are out of school, that means the other students that are in school are, are safer, in my opinion. So uh, I want us to be careful with that. Um, and then I, I would also say I'm just extremely pleased and, and with the progress that the Glenn Center has made. We changed leadership this year. Um, we've made some changes in terms of adding staff. Uh, we've heard some concerns about behavior at that school, but I want you to know that I have walked those halls recently and uh, feel very good about the work that's going on there. I think we're headed in the right direction. Um, I would say that one point I want you to take in consideration as you look at changing your policy about administrative placement versus uh, suspension resulting in placement there is that 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 idea of moving a child from a regular school to the alternative school is sometimes not a popular idea and I think we have to be careful that when we make that shift that if there's some appealable action in place that we make that very clear in the policy that we adopt I don't want to put the administration in a position I'm not asking you to where we would move children against the will of the parent, against um, perhaps what your will would be, and that there's nothing in that policy that would allow the student to appeal that decision. So I think we have to think of that carefully, because there have been a number of times that parents have said, you suspended my child from school. I did not place them at the Glenn Center. I don't want my child at the Glenn Center. Um, I want them back in the regular school, and we have to make sure that that is covered within that policy option as well. 
I agree with Dr. Shepard. I, I tell you, you fellas got your work cut out for you as far as I'm concerned because that's what you call, uh, you know, having your cake and eat it too, you might say. And so uh, I don't know that we're going to be able to do that. Uh, Ms. Blackwater, do you have another comment for I do. Closing? I do. For this report, I would like to see the number, the average number of days a child could possibly be out of school. You know, that's where I've always had an issue when we're doing those appeals is the amount of time, you know, they could have, by the time they go through the process of that appeal, I know one, it was almost a month. So, you know, there's a, there's a time frame there that they're out of school doing something and maybe that something's not good. So I would like to see that piece of it with that report, please. Yeah, that's good, uh, Ms. Blackwater. Thank you. And uh, also, just another little comment. This, you know, we do the, st the uh, student code of conduct. And so this would have to be changed in that also in the consequences. consequences. You know, you either or, or, you know, whichever, uh, Glenn Center or an appealable uh, act there. But anyway, you guys will work that all out and bring it back to us. I appreciate the hard work you did on this and bringing numbers. I'll tell you, numbers can tell you a lot, and then this helps us better understand where we are at the Glenn Center and then what we can also do in the future, though. So it's in your hands, and we'll look to hear from you sometime soon. Thank you. Board members, we're going to move on to 4.05, and I'd like to ask Mr. Wickey to come to the podium. He has his uh, report tonight on the QSCB budget. I usually always press the wrong button, so let me hold on just a second. Yeah. Kelly, are you do you just X out here? Or? Hmm, okay. And I am afraid we're out of it. That's what I was looking for. Yeah. We're out of it. You'll talk and I'll pull it up. That's right. I'm not sure, folks, which uh, document you have first, but uh, if you'll bring up the uh, the budget report, that would be helpful. That's that's the document that looks like this. You're speaking to the status report. Status report. Thank okay. you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, the the changes that have been taking place are really positive, uh, generally in nature. We've been bidding a lot of work, as we've talked about in the past. Um, I noted. Uh, as I was looking at these numbers, we've bid eight out of the nine IT projects uh, that were uh, still to be done. The only remaining one is the Weinkauf uh, Elementary School, and that is, as you know, sort of on hold at this point. So uh, we have eight active projects all bid, and uh, the most recent one is the uh, one I'll speak a little bit later to you about is Central Center, uh, Central High School. <laughs> excuse me, Central Cabarrus High School. Um, and uh, again, we have very good bids on that project. Uh, the one thing that we're running into is a bit of the delay. Uh, a lot of the hardware uh, is, uh, is back ordered and uh, we're getting delays of anywhere from 60 to 90 days at this point. So what we've decided to do with Dr. Probst's agreement, thank you, uh, is to move forward with the installation of the cabling and getting the wireless I just connected the whole thing. Oh. Right? <laughs> so it just would move for me. I see. That's very good. Yeah, just as a note to the board, um, there are a number of parts in the IT industry that were manufactured in Southeast Asia hmm. um, due to flooding there in the past months um, that those parts are not just are not able to be manufactured right now and are not moving out of the countries. Thank you, Ms. Uh, and And as I say, I, I think... Uh, it, it hopefully is as we go forward we'll, we'll have the cabling all in place and uh, ideally uh, we've been told that uh, that some of those orders are being processed now but we're not sure about delivery yet so we're trying not to have it hold up the entire project on any of these and uh, and so we're moving forward with with what we can move forward with uh, we are planning to bid on the 8th of March three uh, large HVAC, uh, they're, they're the chillers, chiller replacement and control replacement projects at Central Cabarrus High School, uh, Mount Pleasant Elementary School, and Mount Pleasant Middle School. So those, those are three very large projects, uh, so, and we're bidding them, unlike uh, Concord and, and um, Northwest, 
high schools, these are being bid together, so we're doing both. And, and the only reason was it was timing with the other ones. We wanted to get the chillers done, if you recall, in the fall and winter uh, and, and not wait for those until summer. With these three projects, we're, we're going ahead with all of it, and uh, hopefully we'll start, we'll, if, if bids come in where we hope they will be, uh, we'd ideally like to start the projects in April uh, at the spring break, followed by work in the summertime uh, to complete those projects. And then the uh, other one that I will mention, and uh, it's, it's pointed out, if you look to the uh, Concord High School dining room addition, and the Concord High School auditorium improvements. There's a note to the right-hand side of the auditorium project. We, we are requesting a move of uh, $10,000. Um, if you recall, when we bid those projects, the auditorium came in high and the dining room came in low. So we shifted money to cover the uh, higher bids up for the auditorium. Um, but what has happened is we, we've done very well, the projects are moving along, but we ran into some bad soil in the courtyard of the dining room addition. And so we have to uh, pay for that to be removed and replaced with good soil, good good bearing soil. And so uh, there's a cost of just under $2,000 for that. And there's also, just recently we, we discovered um, as they were removing brick from inside the courtyard, there, there's um, what used to be exterior brickwork uh, and in an effort to soften the interior of that, they're, they're, they were going to be removing the brick and putting in drywall and, and sound attenuation and all. And uh, it, we're finding that, that there are some structural, I'll call it structural, or just poor construction of the subsurfaces uh, behind the brick. And so that's going to take some additional money. So we're requesting $10,000 to be moved back from the auditorium project to the um, to the dining room project to cover those costs. And that's that's really the, the majority of the changes on this sheet. So if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Board members, any questions on this part? Ms. Spartanbaugh. Uh, I guess I'm just wondering when, there are some other movements of money that we were doing, and I'm not sure when that'll start showing up, like the Northwest Cabarrus High School um, fields was just going to become a partial project, those sorts of things. Yeah, I I'll, I'll be talking about that a little bit later. Okay, uh, but then you'll start updating it on here as well? That's correct. Okay. We, we, protocols require that you vote on that, and then we update this document. So that's the reason for it. But. Okay, thank you, Mr. Whitkey. Uh, board members, on the, the 10000 that he's asking to be moved, uh, how, have, how have we been doing that? Did we do a change order, or we just give a consensus to him, or is that going to be put on as an action agenda? How do we do that, Lynn? Um, it, it, I think the times before we just allowed you the authority to, yeah. to move it. Yeah. Well, that's what I was thinking also, but we, you know, I didn't remember because since I've been chair. But anyway, is that okay with the board for the move move that? Okay, Mr. Whitkey, you have that, no problem. Uh, Ms. Clutch, you want to address it? Kelly, just explain the the budgetary process. And the county is requiring that a formal budget amendment be prepared, and you will get that. It, we we got it on Friday, so it didn't come in time for the deadline. So you will see that come to you in in the next budget meeting. Um, it is in within same function according to our guidelines. You do not have to formally approve it in a budget am amendment, but according to the county, you do. So you will see that. We'll we'll take that to them next time. So we'll be seeing our budget amendment on the 12th. Mm -hmm. Okay, that'll be good. Okay, Mr. Wiki, we can move on forward Thank with you. your other uh, report there, I believe it is. Yes, thank the, you. It's, uh, it's called the milestones. milestones. Yes, the milestone right. report. And on this, uh, what we've been doing is uh, updating all the dates, and, and it certainly reflects everything that's, uh, to my knowledge, as, as current as it can be. Uh, we are, as I mentioned, bidding uh, several of these three projects, rather, on the 8th. Um, and one of the things we're going to be uh, changing this format a little bit for the for the uh, future, uh, because as we, we're beginning to complete these projects now, I just saw the uh, final paperwork come in. For example, on the uh, Beverly Hills Elementary School windows, um, it, it's difficult to sort through all the all the 
information on the sheet. So we're just gonna add a little checkbox, if you will, to say the project's done. And, and so it, it'll just be a very visual thing so that you won't have to spend a lot of time on some of these line items. Uh, we, we've tried to do that. A good example is Culture and Webb Elementary School, the kitchen hood replacement. That says, uh, that one's deleted, for example. And there's another one down a little bit further. Um, uh, let's see, I'll, I'll take you down to, <laughs> as I, I'm looking for one that's been completed is the Beverly Hills Elementary Windows. Yeah, and that, that will eventually go blank, and then we'll just have a little checkbox that indicates that it is fully fully done. So we'll, we'll upgrade that. Um, but all the projects are moving along well. Uh, we'll talk a little bit uh, in, in a moment about uh, the Northwest High School gym. That's, that's the one uh, point one project we're struggling with dollar-wise. But... Uh, everything else is pretty much intact and um, we're able to we have some changes that uh, are being brought about at, at Central Center um, due to uh, um, asbestos uh, uh, materials that we encountered and also some uh, code deficiencies that we have to address so we'll be bringing those to your attention uh, next month as we move forward with those okay mr. wiki a fine report thank you so very much and We'll be moving on here just in a second. Mr. Chairman, uh, yes. I just have a quick question. Okay. I was thinking that this would this agenda would have the discussion about the QSCB2 projects. Um, we had decided that was a good opportunity, but we've uh, we've not heard anything. Can you I'm not sure who needs to speak to that, but I was just curious why it's not on this agenda. Dr. Shepard, can you address that? Since you're, uh, I think there's a very quick timeline here on these matters, and I think we've we've um, we have the list here with us tonight, but it, everything was not, it, it didn't fall out in, a, in an orderly way in order to get it on this agenda. Um, but we can certainly discuss it as a part of this report and bring it to you for action next Monday night, but it would also then require the county doing the same thing and moving it forward by, I think, the 16th, and that's a pretty fast turnaround for this. Okay, I was just thinking we would have the discussion first, approve it, and then it would go to them. So I was thinking that's why it would be on tonight. So I guess I'm a little confused. No? You're right. It, just some deadlines for getting things complete. Okay. Well, I mean, is there any reason we cannot discuss it? It's, it's a small pot of money, so we can't ask for a whole lot, and we already had our priority list established that we couldn't do, so it would seem to be a very quick discussion. I, th I think I would add um, some of the projects that we are looking at are additional schools that require IT improvements. Uh, we have, is it seven, Dr. Probst? The, the list I gave you? Yes. Nine. Nine, nine. Nine additional schools. And I believe that would complete our, uh, our schools. Sure. In a recent MCNC report by the state, they reviewed Kannapolis, Cabarrus County, and our uh, infrastructure, and there were nine schools that were uh, had infrastructures between 10 and 11 years old, and very concerned about our ability to support the online testing by 2014-15. Uh, and the total number for those projects, I think I gave it to you tonight, was around 1.6 million. It would be updating all the um, infrastructures as well as putting wireless access in those schools. It would put those remaining schools at the same uh, level of support that we have given um, the QSCB1 projects. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I believe, what's the total, Lynn? available from the state. I don't think we can go over about $500,000 in a request. Well, no, it, it's a over, entire, excuse me, the entire sum available is just over $12 million for the entire state. Okay. Uh, there, we did talk with DPI. We, we know that some of the counties uh, have submitted requests. Mm -hmm. uh, the one thing that I would offer is uh, that we do have a very good record with DPI. We, we've performed well. We've given them all the information they've, mm -hmm. they've asked for. We have great turnaround uh, with, with our requests to them. So it's working very well. And I think that if we do choose, if, if the boards do choose to go forward with the request, I think we will get a, 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 as good a, a, a nod from them as, as any county will. Uh, the question is, what, what is the request in size? Because I, I would agree, Ms. Fertenball, that there's only a, a limited amount of money to go around when you consider Well, and do we have any idea what the county's tolerance to approve it is? Because they have to eventually That's pay it back. Exactly. It, it's still, it's an extremely low interest rate, but you do have to pay it back. So 
Okay, is, will DPI approve a partial request or is it an all or nothing? We, we asked them about a possible, would they be extending the date or would there be any more after this? And they said, these were reverted funds. These were, mm -hmm. these were funds that they had given out and they came back. Right. Uh, so there, it's possible that that could happen again in the future, but I don't think we want to bet on that. Um, That's not my question. My question uh, is, if we ask for $1.2 mm -hmm. and they only have enough to give us because of the number of requests, 600000 oh. will DPI take that upon them to reduce our list based on like our trigo, our top, our number one to five, not our number one to 10. Will they do that? If not, I think we need to go a little lower to maybe more ensure ourselves getting it. Mm -hmm. I, think that's what we do. I, I just want to make a comment on that because I was board chair the year that we did this. I'm thinking it's the same situation. We set our priority list and we knew how much we were asking for, but we knew that if it topped out or bottomed out at a certain area, we would have to change our priority list. So it would mean no different to me and with this if we start with seven projects and we only wind up doing five because of the money that's really no different to me than what we have with the qscb one projects no but i guess i maybe not understand my question is if we ask for 1.2 and the state doesn't have 1.2 until they get down to us will they approve it for a partial amount of money will dpi do that I think we need to have I, that question answered. I, that's what we started with to begin with, because we knew we were going to ask for a certain amount of money, and they said by the time you finished all your requests, we may not get that amount of money. So we were prepared to do that for the first round of QSC. Okay, projects. as long as their, their process yeah. allows for that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Dr. Okay. Shepard has a comment. He wants to make reference to this, and we can move on. I, I, my recollection is, and Kelly and, and Lynn, correct me if I'm wrong, but we have to complete a separate application for every project, and that we can prioritize those. That's it, right. So it's not one application for 1.2 million. It would be many different applications that would then total 1.2. And in addition to that, we're going to be meeting with the, uh, the county manager tomorrow and uh, the, the chair of the commission. And so that could be one of our topics of discussion at that time. So that'll work out really good. And maybe we'll get some uh, favorable results that we can bring back to the board and on our uh, March 12th business meeting. Ms. Furtenbaugh, you have yeah, something? Yeah, I'm sorry, one more question. I just saw um, Ms. Blackwater having um, been at a technology meeting, had a little list here. I would just request, and, and I'll say out of uh, somewhat respect for Mrs. Uji's, you know, comments the last couple meetings, is that we um, would have the rest of the middle schools at the top of the list followed by the most needy elementaries as opposed to elementaries at the top. Right. That list is not ranked. Uh, it's alphabetical order by elementary and then alphabetical by middle school and I will tell you and I'm sure all my cabinet members will agree that they hear me often to say that we need to do those middle schools first okay I just said in Kelly that would be in the meeting minutes of the technology committee yeah. that you did say that several <laughs> times I think we can move forward now any other comments from the board on this side in particular Miss Carpenter but now don't you have right now you have two of the middle schools included in your budget right now for this year correct actually um, Jan freeze was partially funded with QSCB monies um, Northwest Cabarrus middle and Concord middle are in QSCB it leaves us CC Griffin um, Harris Road middle and then the Opportunity Center and the Opportunity Center we're working with the county uh, on that that issue but I mean I noticed in your but in the budget that you showed us earlier you have those two and they were above the line yes ma'am if um, the QSCB two monies do not come through at, or any other funding um, yes we'll have to look at those using next year's budget but if they were in included in it and they were above that line they, I noticed that. that's right but wouldn't it be wonderful if we could go below that line and fund them? <laughs> okay thank you okay board members any other comments Thank you, Mr. Whitkey. Thank you, Mr. Okay, uh, board members, we're going to move on to 5.0. Uh, we'll be doing the uh, items that's going to be in consideration for our uh, business meeting. But before we move forward, we need to take just a minute for the uh, cameramen to do what they've got to do to change the tape. So just sort of sit tight for a few seconds. <laughs> 